Whereas before, I was talking about how the Industrial Revolution grew in the uh, period from the end of Jackson's presidency in the late 1830s and throughout the 1850s. Uh, we're now going to turn our attention to sort of how uh, people reacted to the changing America. And in this video, we're going to look at the nativism and the unionization movement, the labor movement that grew because of the Industrial Revolution. First, we'll look at the... Uh, nativism. The Irish Catholics that I uh, mentioned earlier were pouring into the United States in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s. They tended to maintain their culture. They stayed in uh, the cities, large cities, and you know that annoyed the majority, many of whom, of course, had come from Great Britain. Many Americans began to say that the Irish Catholics couldn't understand American government. They were used to following orders of the Pope. And if they got too numerous, American would be controlled by the Pope. Here we have a cartoon showing the pl Pope plotting to take over America. The second wave of Protestant evangelicalism, known as the Second Great Awakening, really augmented the anti-Catholic feelings. Here you can see another cartoon. It shows the alligators with the Catholic, the, the you know the sort of the papal looking hat on, and they're they're threatening the population. The Irish Catholics were always depicted as ugly and drunk and and belligerent. One of the most foremost of the uh, nativist, prominent nativist, was Samuel Morse, who is of mentioned earlier as an inventor of the Morse code. He was a, a rabid anti-Catholic. Samuel Morse used his fame to write a nativist pamphlet called A Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States. It was reprinted numerous times and serialized in newspapers across the country. Morse worried that all the Protestant denominations were so competitive they would not unite against their common enemy, the Catholics. Another prominent nativist writer was Lyman Beecher. He was a president of the powerful Lane Seminary in Cincinnati, Ohio, and he wrote a pamphlet called A Plea for the West. Beecher noted that Catholic parents sent their children to parochial schools, Catholic-run schools, which undermined the American New England tradition of free public education. They were, Beecher said, tearing their, uh, teaching their children to dominate the new state governments that would form out of this, out of the growing Western territory. And so he thought the, uh, the Western movement of people, the, the Protestants, should organize against this. This nativist anti-Catholicism predictably led to violence. As early as the 1830s, after a hostile sermon by Beecher, an angry mob of Protestants attacked the Ursuline convent uh, in Boston. There, Beecher claimed the nuns were training young Catholic warriors. In fact, many of the children that attended the school were not even Catholic. The idea of nuns themselves never getting married, living together, seemed kind of alien to the Protestant mob. In the end, the nuns had to flee, and the convent was completely burned down. Another notable pamphlet was the Awful Disclosures of the Hotel Dieu Monastery in Montreal, written by a woman named Maria Monk. It told the story of a Catholic monastery in Quebec, Canada. Uh, of course, Quebec, Canada is Catholic. It was a fictitious story, but it told of a sweet young Protestant girl kidnapped and held against her will by the priests in the monastery. The monastery was full of corruption, pornography, illegitimate births, and so forth. The manuscript was rejected by the largest publishers as inflammatory, but it was eventually published by a small publisher and then became one of the country's best sellers. Such nativism was growing in the 1830s, but it really got even uglier in the 1840s and 1850s. In 1855, for example, in Ohio, a mob attacked a Catholic neighborhood and killed 22 people. This became known as Bloody Monday. In addition, there were a number of murders across the country, and priests were a common target. Two Catholic churches were burned in Philadelphia. Pope Pius IX in 1853 sent a bishop, Gitano Bedini, to investigate the American nativism, the American anti-Catholicism, and a mob formed in an attempt to, to lynch Bedini. In the end, police kept the mob from killing Bedini, but the resulting riot killed and injured dozens. 
Bedini was uh, disguised and snuck out of the uh, city, New York City, and went back to Rome. By the 1850s, the anti-Catholic forces had begun to coalesce into a, a political party that they called the American Party. And you can see here, Native Americans, beware of foreign influence. And they don't mean Indians, by the way. The American Party be, uh, began to be known as the Know-Nothing Party. The American Party was called the Know Nothing Party because it grew out of a secret sect known as the Order of the Star Spangled Banner, also known as the Order of the United Americans. They'd meet in secret, and when people would ask about the order, they'd say, Hey, I know nothing. To join the Order of the Star Spangled Banner, you had to promise one of two things. First, that you were born in the United States, that both parents were Protestants, that you were not married to a Catholic, and that you would vote only for people born Protestant in the United States. Second, you had a promise that you would run for office yourself, promising that if elected, if your ample office is up and you were elected, you would remove all, quote, foreigners, aliens, and Catholics from office, unquote. When James W. Barker took over the Order of Star Spangled Banner in the early 1850s, he began a, a dramatic membership rise and publicity campaign. He was a great organizer. Soon Barker had formed the American Party in New York State. The American Party uh, then won a, a series of elections in New York and then began forming uh, uh, conventions in, in other states. They did well in Massachusetts, Delaware, and Pennsylvania, all of which had experienced large Catholic immigration. By 1854, uh, Barker was holding a, a national convention in New York City. He was trying to get representation in the original 13 states. That year's election, 1854, the American, or the Know Nothing Party, actually won 75 congressional seats. The party, however, began to die out by the middle of the 1850s. Slavery split the, split the party in half, north and south, and the issue of slavery just divided the party, just like it did every, everybody else in America. And I'll talk about that in the... Uh, in the coming videos. Now we're going to shift gears and begin looking at another reaction to the Industrial Revolution and the period after the Jackson presidency. And we're going to look at the formation of uh, the American labor movement, American unions, and also the anti-Masonic movement. Anyway, by, uh, you know, the, the labor movement's going to grow out of the exploitation of workers that was growing in the Industrial Revolution. Obviously, this is going to be much more important later in the 19th century. For much of the period until the uh, late 1820s, labor unions were considered illegal in much of the United States. The ones that did exist were often local and simply organized around one craft, or you might say one skill. In the 1830s, however, organizations on a larger scale began to take hold. In 1834, the National Trade Union was set up to coordinate all the local craft unions. And by 1836, you begin to see national organizations in a, several industries, like industries like the printing industry, or the shoemakers, comb makers, carpenters, and handloom uh, weavers. Many of these early organizations, these early unions, were struggling during the the 1830s, and they were especially hurt hard by the Panic of 1837. Shown here is an early anti-union cartoon showing them in an unsympathetic manner. By the 1830s and 40s, you begin to see the beginnings of workers trying to influence politics more directly. In 1828, in Philadelphia, laborers formed the Working, working Men's Party. By 1836, similar parties had formed in New York City, Boston, and other cities. They never really had much success in the period, however. Related to the growth of workers' parties in the 1830s was the anti-Mason movement, which had first appeared during the era of good feelings. Freemasonry, or the Mason movement, grew out of stonemasons' organizations over centuries before, but by the 19th century it evolved into secret fraternal organizations of leading businessmen and, and politicians. While they stressed enlightenment principles, hard work, and charity, many in the working class and among the emerging workers' unions believed the Masons sinister and elitist, rigging the economy and country to their own benefit. This led to an anti-Mason party, 
but by the end of the 1830s, the party had begun to fade. Many of its members subsumed into the Whig Party. Anyway, as evidenced by the growth of the labor organizations and the Annie Mason movement, the, uh, the Industrial Revolution and the Antebellum period had begun to consolidate wealth and therefore exacerbate class divisions and increase urban poverty. De Tocqueville may not have seen it uh, in 1831. You know, he was coming from a European perspective anyway. But it was starting to grow and would really uh, continue to grow in the latter half of the 1800s, ultimately leading to the progressive movement for reform at the end of the 19th century. But that's a story for another day. This concludes the uh, first video on the reaction to industrialization in the, in the period after the Jacksonian uh, era.